a warm welcoming back to this uh, Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. You happening to be with us the 318th time if you watch all the episodes of this show here. And us is uh, you, DeSoto Brown, otherwise Bishop Museum historian. With us again, hi, DeSoto. Good morning, good day, whatever it is when you're watching this. Mm -hmm. And me, Martin Despang. And uh, this is uh, catching up on your birthday, which you had last week. And we celebrated in the breakers, both of you turning 70. <laughs> and um, uh, today we're going to reflect and probably more shows. We're going to reflect a little bit on what the sparks of the breakers can all cause or have caused. And for sure, if it's one thing that it has to do with internationally, it's about the perception of paradise. And although uh, the, the Tiki movement really didn't originate particularly here, but on other Polynesian islands, Tahiti being one of them, many people associate it with us, right? So um, back to back, um, talking birthdays, and we're thinking about, you know, when now our dear friend Rich is currently in the hospital and Bundit is on his side and, um, you know, his, uh, his, his engine is, needs a little bit of retuning. So we wish him all the best. Um, and so, um, again, birthdays, the older we get, uh, then think about every day is a birthday, right? But in many cultures or religion, we celebrate that one day that we were born on. And back to back, uh, when this show will be posted, it will have been our exotic escapism expert Zuzana's birthday, have been. And she's also our uh, foreign correspondent in many ways, because when I can't be there, she keeps feeding us with things. And you like, she brought you once. What did she bring you, DeSoto? She brought me the Trader Vic's menu from um, Munich. It's, yeah. it's the German one. And yeah, yeah. that was the big moment of excitement and i was presented that right here on this show so i got to yeah. i got to get it live in front of an audience that made it even more fun exactly and that one is from for you the historian it's from 1972 our favorite year in many ways and it was when the olympics were there that we're very fond of and that is still there which is really great and it's pretty much unchanged but we also want to report on new things so here is the surprise now. When I was there over the holidays, we were doing this footage here. This is a new bar, and that is called Maui. Uh, <laughs> and it's got this phrase that we got a kick out of that you see here. They call this Hawaiian kitchen. <laughs> so it's obviously a, a, a blend, a, a fuse, a fusion of Hawaiian and Asian, so they don't want to just cook you know, Hawaiian, whatever, you know, people think about what that even is, right? And I threw in a couple of other cookies. So here is your fan and collector of, of menus. So here's a menu here with uh, the things that I thought you get the most kick out of. It. So what's your response? What you see? This, as usual, um, it's one of the things that am amazes me as a native speaker of American English is how pervasive the English language is all over the world in so many different cultures. And it amazes me to see that in Germany, as you, for you, it's normal, but for me, it's amazing how much English is in use in everyday, in everyday life there, and how sometimes menus are almost entirely in English for German people. And so here we have, what, the Honolulu Juicer, the Kama Aina, the Blue Hawaiian, on the menu. Now, yeah. one of the things that just happened to me in reverse, you can see in the upper right corner of the screen here, because I was at a coffee bean restaurant, not a restaurant, but a coffee place. And I looked at the familiar yellow and black danger signs or warning signs. And to my great surprise, right in front of me, this one not only was in English and not only was in Spanish, which we often see, but it also has German. On it. And I thought, why on earth is there a German caution sign in Honolulu? And why does the company even make them with German and Spanish? How many places in the world would those languages, those three languages, all be in current use? But regardless of that, 
It's a little touch of Germany in Honolulu rather than a large touch of Honolulu in Germany, which is what we normally see. Yeah, and the the word for you, the the home uh, work word for you was you see it down there. Yeah, and I can't remember. It means slip hazard, and I exactly. can't remember no. what it was. Rutschgefahr, as it says down there, but that's Rutschgefahr. Tough. There you go. Very good. Very good. Very good. That's right. So with this, going back to the menu, it's actually a fusion too, because if you read the ingredients that's here, at the very bottom, kokos creme is not an English word, nor is citronensaft. The others are. So it's, again, it's this blend, which the Mai Tai, which is an happy birthday, uh, again, uh, is holding there, right? And so um, it, it's all a blend, right? We're all one big world now, um, and we can go to these little places, uh, some more than others, because it takes some money to do that. So it's not as inclusive as we wish, but it's not as back in the days when the whole movement was born, where people pretty much in America couldn't travel a lot because that was the beginning of America becoming very prosperous. And then so it was basically brought to them rather than going to it, right? Yeah. And that happens. This is an architecture show after all this. Uh, what did you want to say? Oh, I was going to say, too, that uh, there was also a fascination in Germany with the South Seas and with Hawaii. And uh, for them, it was really out of the question, uh, even until quite you know, just recent decades to be able to travel that far away. Um, the technology wasn't there. It was far too expensive. It took far too much time. And so hardly anybody in Germany who longed for a romantic, warm vacation could actually take one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why we retract to these restaurants where it's heated. That was Christmas, you know, and it's nice and cozy. The the it's it's a nice you know um, architecture is is also interior design as they call it or interior architecture in best case there is no separation between the two in the old days of Frank Lloyd Wright and and um, Charles Rennie McIntosh I remember in Glasgow it was all the arts and crafts and everything is one thing but this is a restaurant in an existing building and it's fairly nicely done. Uh, the the vegetation, however, is artificial that we don't like. Um, so um, it 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 tries hard again to get you into the mood of the place they name it after, and it's it's a good place. We like it. We go there. And the way I found out about it, and this gets us back to exterior architecture versus interior architecture, because when I had to be at this building there at the top, which is a longer story, but uh, I was standing there because I was angry, because this is my embassy. This is the, while you have a Hawaiian side and an American side, I have an American side since a couple of years and a German side. So my American side was going there because um, we had some visa issue with uh, Suzanne that we don't want to get into. That's a longer story. So while being going there and trying to make my case, I needed to find parking with a Twingo. And around that area, I found this restaurant. So it's very close by to actually where the sort of, um, uh, I guess, the representation of American culture is uh, politically, because this is the consulate in, in Munich. And this is a force for you to make you happy. This is a historic picture, because you can only imagine why it doesn't look like that. I mean, it's still, the buildings are still there, but there was an event in 2001 that changed it forever as the world. So now it's all barricaded. Now it's all protected with big boulders and stuff like that. But we threw in that little text here that we researched. Uh, also, the building's origination is actually a blend, is a fusion like you do with drinks, with picky or the, the music, right? The exotica music, these are all blends. This is a blend because America thought that its utmost corporate firm, Skidmore Owings Merrill, that we've been talking a lot about, to our favorite buildings we have on the islands here, which is the Mauna Kea Beach Hotel and on UH, the School of Engineering, uh, both buildings. And America thought, okay, they're going to build our embassy. Well, then these stubborn Bavarians, as Sweetheart Suzanne is one of them. Basically said, no, 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 you, you're not going to do that. That's going to be very imperialist. You know, we, we need to set you aside one of our architects. 
And this is also our favorite. There's a show yet to be aired, which we call um, Germany's Most Hawaii Architect. And that sounds very exciting, hopefully, for you. And so I look forward to that one. And so that is Zep Roof. Um, and Zep Roof was then sort of collaborating. So again, the building is, is both, right? It's both American and German, and it's a blend of the two. And again, uh, Suzanne, our um, foreign correspondent, hot off the day when she came off work, which is working at a school, they had the uh, U.S. Uh, diplomat, the utmost ambassador of the United States in Germany, Amy Gutmann, you would call her, but her name traces back to German. That is Gutmann. And she came to com commemorate uh, the White Rose event. And we had uh, the 79th anniversary of you Americans. Thank you to Soto and everyone else. And Ron, as a veteran, having saved us from our darkest, what we caused ourselves, and basically liberated us from that Nazi regime and also, um, again, the Holocaust. And, um, and Auschwitz was basically liberated 79 uh, years ago. And that's the content that she is basically coming. She's coming to, she spoke at LMU, which is the Ludwig Maximilian University, which is not TUM that we actually have in exchange Thomas Auer come to speak us and put this on your calendar. It's going to be in March. I'll tell you the exact date. It's, you, it's a must. You need to go. So Thomas comes all the way from Germany and talks about climate engineering, which is something we think is, is very, very important. So um, he's from Tom, but she spoke at LMU and she also spoke at Suzanne School uh, to the students there, again, about the importance of anti-Semitism not happening again. For sure, if there's one country culture where it shouldn't happen again, it's ours because we've been there, done it in the, in the worst way, right? So that is um, all hot off the press uh, as of today. And so we can move on to the next slide. And this is also very familiar to you in many ways, right? We did many coverages on that one, air ventilated mobiles and air ventilated immobilia, which is architecture. But this is also interesting that, again, like the Maui Munich is of these days, right? But you think of tiki bars being from back in the day, right? So different than the breakers. This is about what, what is the breakers doing? What is the breakers keeping alive? So while this is the T2 model, the, the, it's not the very first bus. That was the T1, but that's the T2. And uh, that one was produced. I'm getting very um, sort of patriotic in my hometown of Hanover. This is where all the buses by VW were done, are still done to these days but also in other parts of Germany and also in other parts of the world. And this is the point here. When I was dry, doing a little cruising trip to check on with our um, PI mobile, uh, driving by, um, you know, the Obama, because again, one of his buddies, the Magnum PI had one of these, right? And so I'm always checking on what's going on there. And I'm driving by a little further Sandy Beach, and I see this thing here, and I chat these people up. And what they told me is totally fascinating. They, first of all, they said they rent this, which is, makes us, okay, this is kind of illegal, right? Because you can actually drive around in these, but you cannot sleep in them. That's the law, because they want to you know, prevent competition between all the profit-making hotels and Airbnbs these days. And uh, the second thing is that I basically said, wow, this is uh, what year is this? And they said, well, we have lots of people coming by and actually teaching us that this is an, a novelty uh, from another tropical area. This is, this is a Brazil-made uh, bus that was made until fairly recently in 2013, while the original one was discontinued in 79, I believe. So this is, again, just like with a Tiki, the legacy goes on and is to be continued because people think something actually both tropical exotic, although not born necessarily, you know, here, but they both very much identify as artist Nick Kuchar, who is following us and we him at the top right, you see, 
I gave you a sticker for Christmas from his a Beatles sticker, you know, so he's very much indulging in that in that sort of zeitgeist, and he calls it the van life. That particular sticker is called the van life. Well, again, uh, Nick is also, as you see, he's uh, showing himself in front of his own bus, which we like the most because that's the utmost easy breezy. And hey, doggy behind you, you're a doggy. There's a fellow doggy looking through there. So I'm sure they're going to both get, get very excited about it. And, <laughs> don't, you know, don't, give the, any, don't give her any ideas. She's calm at the moment. Leave her alone. The, the really cool thing about this is, at, you know, while it was from the distance, really looks very familiar to me, not only, you know, hometown-wise, where they were made and they're my culture, but the closer I got, and this is also applying to these tiki places, you know, when it's well done like the Maui Munich, so this is probably the good analogy from the other realm, you know, first you think like, oh, it looks kind of, you know, there is no such thing of authenticity. It's the authenticity of fakeness or the fakeness of authenticity. It's all fictional, right? But but it's it's well done. And then the closer I got, I saw so many details that didn't, they made sense to them, but not to me where I came from. So I watched like you, a lot of YouTubes where they were going on and on what they all changed and actually optimize. Like for example, in Brazil, no, no autobahns existing, so bumpy roads. So they actually need to weld in more kind of, you know, trusses and, and beams to stiffen out the car and, and, and other things like that. They're really yeah, fascinating. I, think I can see just by looking at it, the arrangement of the windows is different. And that was, I think the thing that, that also impresses me is that Volkswagens, as we've discussed many, many times, became so international and became locally here associated with a whole sort of subculture and the vans in particular in California, the West Coast and here in the Hawaiian Islands became associated with surfing. And yeah. so this is something that obviously is foreign to Germany where the van originated, but it was adopted and adapted for surfing and surf culture in the United States and here in Hawaii. And that's something that, again, is nobody could have anticipated it. It just evolved that way. And today, the reason that Nick does these stickers of Volkswagens is because they are associated in memory with this carefree surfing lifestyle that nobody in Germany ever thought about when they were first under construction. Yeah. And, you know, he even has his doggy, your guy's doggy, at the, as part of the sticker. That, that's that's really good. And again, why in, in with all these problems in the world, why are we kind of, you know, uh, doing dinking around here with your recreational vehicles? There's another show that we have pre-produced already, which makes us rethink maybe revisiting the policy of that the mobile can be in immobilia again. So again, the strictness again of no RVs here, no trailers. Is really coming from, again, the profitability of the hotels. They don't want that. They don't want that as competition. So hopefully no one watches this and reports that that would be unfair because I think this is nice because I asked them also, because talking about affordability, right? Do we price out paradise? That's what we do, right? Everything gets gentrified. And in this show, we will show things that used to be, you know, relatively, uh, you know, affordable and are not anymore. So this one here, I asked him, and I said, yeah, no, we're, we're here for five days, and we thought, you know, this is a good alternative, and it was 200 bucks per night. And now, if you think about, you need to rent the whole entire room, and you need to rent a car, this is then, you know, still, I mean, the breakers is 150 starting, right? But to find a, a rental car for 50 bucks um, is probably tough, right? And so this is, this is, again, this is a rather inclusive way of hospitality. And hopefully, again, maybe rethinking it could also be an alternative to, to dwelling for the, for the suburb, and especially in this particular case, which people are doing, right? They're, they're finding their niches. You see vans, you know, out-commissioned car, you know, larger vans from others that, that you can, you know, imagine people are living in there, but it's, not you know it's illegal so again you can drive in it but you can't sleep in it with this kind of an odd way of of sort of legally thinking about it 
So we want to we want to encourage again, maybe opening up the mind again, and you, the audience, please do that. I mean, these are just examples of us dinking around and driving around and walking around and seeing things and sparking our curiosity and then digging deeper. And there's a lot of potential here in in things that that we already have adopted and adapted, as you perfectly put that. So let's go move on, next slide, and dive a little bit into our dive, <laughs> because I'm uh, talking a resort that the Breakers claims to be, and we've been supporting that in the previous show, um, what actually is now the, 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 the munchy part of it, which is the sushi restaurant, uh, Ethel told us, and uh, Houston Guzman, who is the, uh, the, the, the the landscaping guy, told us it used to be a tiki bar in it, which makes then total sense, right? The breakers being Polynesian pop themed, and you have a tiki bar in it. Well, that's long gone, and now is the sushi bar, which is good to have too. But they pointed out, go over there, <laughs> cut you know diagonally across. And and end up uh, on um, opposite diagonally opposite of the post office there next to eggs and things. There's this very kind of informal kind of entrance to this place here. Once again, kind of marked through this sticky uh, uh, poem, um, totem. And then so next slide that walks us through, gets us closer. So here you see there's something happening in the back. Next slide. We're gonna walk you guys through here in a little faster pace. So, but here we can see details, right? It's obviously themed. So formally we see what we expect from a tiki bar, but performatively that we actually, if not more interested in, you can see here the protection from the elements, right? And one's from the sun and second from the rain. And you see this here in two parts. You got this sort of bamboo lattice that protects you from the sun, but still lets light through its gap. And then you have a corrugated plastic over it. So we actually, which you will see soon, have been there in the rain. And while all other people say, ooh, we got to go inside, you know, we did not need to because they facilitated in a pretty clever way which make us again think if you can do this for eating, you know, then uh, you might also be able to do this for living. That's our point all the time, right? Embrace the outdoor. So let's move on to the next slide. So here's where we were sitting under. And yes, they are a little sort of improvised. So these sails were like filling with rainwater. And then the waitress had to come with a broomstick and get the water out, and we had to move away from it for a time. But that makes it fun, right? And it makes you actually, when you then think, oh, I'm coming from New York City, you know, I could never do this. Well, when you sit inside, you forget about that, right? But here it's really kind of, you know, hypersensitizing you about what we are about here, you know, year round and day at night, being able to do that. Next slide. Yeah, so it has an indoor part, but there's sliding doors, folding doors, always open. I don't think they're ever closed. Next slide. And there is the indoor part of it with a counter. And of course, it has American culture, watching TV all the time, right? And watching sports. So you can call it a sports bar, but you also got the sports utensil of the indigenous, the surfboard there. So once again, you got a blend of of cultures, right? Next slide. This is important. I let you talk about it because part <laughs> of it is also from you. Yeah. Well, obviously, uh, a sports bar is usually intended for men. And in a bar that's intended mostly for men, not that this bar is exclusively patronized by men, um, you also like to have sexy things of women. And in this particular situation, these are depictions of women sexualized in the pose of a hula dancer who's topless. Now, in reality, by the time photography got to the Hawaiian Islands in the 1840s, Hawaiian women were not going around in public without covering their breasts. 
that had already long been established. The missionaries had been here since 1820, and women covered their bodies. But still it remained in, in other cultures. Obviously, in the Pacific and in Asia, there were women who were not covering their breasts. And so that's just sort of got pushed back into, well, the Hawaiian women are the same way, which they were not. Here are, in, not only in this life-size or this large mannequin who's very sexualized, but also the photographs. So there are two sets of old photographs. The one and the lower one is, in fact, a picture from the 1800s, from the 1890s. But that woman is sitting in a photo studio. And one of the things that she's doing, she's sitting on a pahu drum. That is absolutely forbidden in Hawaiian culture. You do not do that. That's considered offensive. She's sitting on it because the photographer told her to as part of the pose. And the fact that she doesn't have a top on is also part of what the photographer did. And the pictures above that are very interesting. They're from the early 1940s. They're from World War II. And this is a very young Asian woman, maybe even a teenager. She's probably Japanese. And she posed for a lot of topless and nude photographs at the time, which were sold as souvenirs to guys in the military. And I've always been curious about her story as to why and how she was doing something like that, which in Japanese culture, for family connections, would be considered rather shameful. So these yeah. are mysterious stories with that you don't know the backstory of, even though just in this bar, they're just part of the decoration. And there's a little yeah. more to it than just that. Yeah, and it's it's very loaded, you know, gender and discrimination loaded, and it needs a lot of discussion. We're just kicking it off, and we actually have to then start out this way, rightly so, at the beginning. But in the few minutes left, I will say that, again, the, the picture at the top left, the left one of the two, when you turn it around, um, it says the Soto Brown Collection. In fact, when you buy it at a newsstand, that surprises you. <laughs> and the one at the bottom right is a Bishop Museum one. <laughs> so, and again, and there are both, the picture I took at the bottom left is from our youngest one, Jonathan, who you know when they were here. And he's uh, displaying that in his shelves next to a Nixon watch uh, case. Case That's also a surf, um, um, you know, accessory company. Anyway, so there's a lot of, again, the perception of paradise. And um, hopefully you're going to be with us again when we continue on this one here. And until then, please stay uh, profoundly Polynesian poppy versus postmodernly. See you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>